Please take your Bibles and turn back to that passage we read just a few moments ago over in Exodus chapter 15 and looking at verses 22 through 27. As you know, we're doing a series on the ten times that the Jews rebelled against God in the wilderness wanderings, and we have also seen very clearly stated for us in the New Testament that the ten failures of Israel and the other examples given in the Old Testament were given for us during the church age. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says it specifically, in fact, it'll make reference here in this passage to the incident of the golden calf. You say, but I don't see the golden calf in there, but you'll see it because it is specifically quoted in this passage here. It says, they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters as were some of them as it is written. And here is a direct quote out of a passage we're going to look at today. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So what's wrong with playing? Were they playing badminton? Were they playing soccer? Maybe they're playing football or baseball? Uh, old, you know, um, maybe, maybe it was tennis. Joseph served in Pharaoh's court. <laughs> uh, or maybe it was baseball in the beginning. But anyway, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. What is that talking about? Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. And then of course Paul goes on and gives examples of wickedness that God found among his own people. Now remember this is our example. So that means that God is going to look to see if there is evil among his own people in the church today looking for evil among his own people. Now all these things happen unto them for examples and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And we saw that Peter said the same thing using homosexuality as one of the three prime examples because he speaks of Sodom and Gomorrah and he says making them an example unto those that afterwards should live ungodly. And Jude says the same thing over in Jude 1.7 even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example suffering anybody who's involved in that listen to this suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. That's serious business, and that's what God says. Now, the first thing that we learned when we were talking about the golden calf started two weeks ago was the issue of impatience. It's a serious example for us today. The people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount. The people gathered themselves unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. Now God is up on top of the mountain with Moses. The Shekinah glory is up on top of the mountain. They want something to go before them. Up to this point, the Shekinah glory has been leading them through the wilderness. Suddenly it's disappeared. They say, we don't know what happened to it. We don't know what happened to Moses. He's out of here. Let's get something and let's get moving. They demand action and, of course, feel-good entertainment. They don't like leadership that makes them wait. They get impatient with leadership that makes them seek the face of God. So, as Israel did with Aaron, they're willing to commission somebody to make it up as you go along rather than waiting for God to reveal himself. And we talked about how much the Bible says about patience. Uh, we saw that there were 16 different key lessons that the Bible teaches on patience, but they can be boiled down into three key principles. Principle number one, out of those 16 lessons which, we, lessons which we drew from many, many passages all over the Old Testament and New Testament, number one, patience is absolutely essential to the victorious Christian life. You cannot have a victorious Christian life without patience. As we're boiling those 16, those 16 uh, different lessons down, the three key principles are number one, patience is absolutely essential to the victorious Christian life. Boiled down, condensed principle number two is impatience always leads to rebelling against the will of God and landing in carnal sin. Impatience always leads to rebelling against the will of God and landing in carnal sin. Principle number three condensed from those 16 different lessons it has two sides to this third key principle. Patience has two sides. First, it means that you not only refrain 
from natural impulses. Now, when we say natural impulses, we're talking about the flesh. The flesh is the natural impulse that you get when certain choices arise. It's, what do I like to do that would make me feel good? So the first half of it is you refrain from natural impulses. The second half is the other side. Instead, you examine every option to see if it fits with biblical principles. And you may discover an option you don't like, but you say, if I'm going to compare what I want with what God wants, by the grace of God, I'm going to choose what God wants. So patience has two sides. Number one, refraining from natural impulses, and second, examining every option to see if it fits with biblical principles. Then finally, we contrasted patience with sloth. Genuine patience is not sloth for three reasons. Number one, because the Bible set patience in contrast to sloth. Number two, patience must be exercised by faith to obtain the promises of God. And walking by faith is never sloth. Without faith, there are no promises. Without patience, there are no promises. It's absolutely, patience is absolutely essential. It's necessary to experience the blessings and the promises of God. You will not get God's blessings. You will not get God's promises if you are not patient. I don't know how to emphasize that enough. We all want God to bless us. We all want to get the promises of God. But we're not willing to wait. We're the microwave generation. I want it now, or 30 seconds from now at maximum. Patience is exercised by faith, but without it, you don't get God's blessing and promises. And third, the third genuine patience is not sloth for the third reason. God not only commands patience, but God does specific certain things in our lives to develop patience. We don't like it, but God uses suffering to develop patience. God says he's going to work it in our lives. So obviously it's not God working sloth in our lives. The second thing, major lesson that we learned from the golden calf deals with compromising secondary leadership. That's the kind of leadership that takes their marching orders from the congregation rather than standing up to the congregational pressure and providing real leadership. Real leadership waits for the direction of God, is not afraid to tell the congregation to wait as well. But here Aaron was a wimp. Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them to me. We dealt quite a bit with the New Testament, uh, which talks about apostates tickling the itching ears of compromising churches. But it's the responsibility of biblical leadership to fight hard against apostasy in light of eternity. And that's first, uh, second, second Timothy, excuse me. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. That's what was going on with Israel. After their own lusts, they wanted somebody who was going to scratch their ears. They wanted to hear something different than what Moses had been telling them, different than what God had been saying out of the Shekinah glory. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And you remember, of course, that Aaron told the men to lead their own families into that wickedness because men are accountable for leadership that they give to their families, whether righteous or evil. The wives and the children follow the leadership of the fathers in our text. The twofold responsibility of leadership is to fight faithfully against apostasy and to stand firmly against falling back into loving this present world. Paul writes of one of his followers who did that, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. The third thing that we learned about the golden calf failure was that people always eagerly support bad leadership and bad theology financially if they think it will give them a feel-good experience. Compromising people always support bad leadership and bad theology financially. You see some of these gigantic cathedrals where apostate preachers are preaching and raking in the dough, and some of them within the so-called evangelical community, and within the past several weeks, it has been revealed that one of them was doing all kinds of sexually inappropriate things, one of the biggest churches in this country known as an evangelical church. They're people 
People always eagerly support bad leadership and bad theology financially if they think it's going to give them a feel-good experience. And the corollary to that is the most compromising people will rarely support good leadership and good theology financially. They just don't do it. Compromising congregations talk the talk but fail to walk the walk. Now, there are some congregations that are not compromising congregations where the people in the congregation are actually committed to Christ 100%. They are few and far between. You'll find churches where there's one or two or maybe three who are 100% committed to Christ, but most are not. Because it's uncomfortable, and we're Americans, and we want it to be comfortable for us. Compromising congregations talk the talk but fail to walk the walk. They'd rather have the truth tellers fend for themselves or make faithful pastors pay their own way or compromise a little bit to get bigger salaries because they know that money talks. For compromisers, it talks big time. For manipulators, it talks big time because it's a tool they try to use to get leadership to compromise and go soft on sin. For compromising leaders, it talks big time because it greases the road for a big bank account and an easy life. And all the people break off their golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. The fourth thing that we learn from the golden calf test is that there are religious leaders who will change their theology for cash. You understand there's a theology switch, a major theology switch that's going on in the golden calf passage. Verse 4, And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, now obviously he saw it, because he, he's the one that melted it down. He's the one that poured it into the mold to make the calf. He's the one that took the graving tool and, you know, etched in the fine lines to make everything look really sharp. When Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to Yahweh, to the Lord, to Jehovah. Now, last week, I started this section here. We noticed the process by which a compromising leader sanctifies sin. You know, to make people who are carnal happy, you have to somehow sanctify their sin. You have to make them feel good about their sin. And so the compromising leader made it, Aaron, made it seem like it was really acceptable in case there were any doubters in the congregation. In our day and age, it may be, for example, in the area of finding so-called biblical reasons for divorce. Or it may be trying to find a biblical rationale for going into debt. Or it may be in the area of finding reasons for ecumenical evangelism, as we saw sadly in the case of Billy Graham. Compromising leaders will always try to have some kind of excuse for leading people into sin, even if the people first demand it. They say, well, now you're our leader. This is what we want. Well, I'm going to lead. You're not going to go that way. Well, then you're not our leader. Get out of here. We want to find somebody who will do what we want to do. That's what's going on with Israel here. What did Aaron do? First, he made something visible. He gets a focal point to grab the attention of the congregation. It can be an idol, like a fat Buddha, or an exclusive society to which donors can give, or prime link of their name written in a big newsletter. I get these things from all the schools I graduated from. At the end of each year, they have a, a great big thing where they have all the different circles of donors. And everybody who gave a $50,000 or more is in this circle, and uh, with some of my alma maters, like my law school is, anybody who gave a million dollars or more is in this circle. But they all have at least start at 50,000 and then go down from there and then, you know, uh, and patrons are down at the $500 level or something like that. Or it can be promises of wealth. For example, if you just send your faith pledge to the evangelist. Or get a building named after you. Or buildings that show off the supposed faith of the church and the nonprofit organization. But as I pointed out last week, drawing attention to a focal point that misses the point is the exact same trick that is used by stage magicians. You draw the attention of the audience to something else with one hand while you secretly do something with the other hand. And I can remember a specific illustration of this. It, it still gives me a grin because this happened 50 or 60 years ago. Um, my dad was a great preacher. 
one day he had a cold. And um, I remember one of the elders later told me about this, that he had seen what my dad did. My dad had to blow his nose, so he did. And then he began to make a point, and he gestured up like this, and everybody looked up there. And meanwhile, he dropped it over the rail, <laughs> the Kleenex over the rail behind him. That's the way magicians work, folks. You know, they draw your attention to something that misses the real point that needs to be made. Now, here's where we start today. The second thing that we see in relation to sanctifying sin is that Aaron made a bold-faced lie. You know, Hitler understood this. His ministers of disinformation understood this. You tell a big enough lie long enough, people will believe it. Here's the lie that Aaron gave them. These be thy gods. These be thy gods. And he offered some proof. You see, the lie was supported by a visible focal point. Today, the lie is supported by testimonials, as in the case of modern apostates or their prayer cloths that you send back to the charlatan with your donation. Notice how Aaron personalized the claim. He called it, Thy gods. Note also, he called them, O Israel. O Israel. That's the name that God gave to Jacob when the angel of the Lord wrestled with Jacob at Peniel. And we know from studying the context that that was the Lord Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ, who's wrestling with Jacob at Peniel. The face of God. That's in Genesis 32, 28. That is a name that means having power with God. Aaron prostitutes the name Israel by connecting the golden calf to the promises made by God to Jacob concerning his posterity and his future. Third, did you notice something else that said, these be thy gods? Aaron opened the door for a future slide back into polytheism of Egypt. Egypt was loaded with hundreds of gods who were responsible for many different things. There was the god of the Nile, there was the sun god, there was the moon god, there were storm gods, there were gods responsible for fertility and crops. Aaron said, these be thy gods. At the moment, he is presenting them with a single golden calf. But he simultaneously suggests that there may be other gods involved in Israel's deliverance from Egypt. Fourth, notice also that he tied mythology into historical reality. Mythology tied to historical reality. As you go back and look at Greek mythology or the mythologies of any of the various cultures, you will find that there are things that are tied to historical realities. For example, Ken Ham as well illustrated this in his uh, uh, museum at the Ark, uh, where he traces, I think, near a hundred uh, ancient cultures that have a flood story. But all the flood stories differ. Uh, sometimes they're floating around in round boats uh, that have holes in the top and the bottom, which you think, how did that work? <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, they, they've got all these, sometimes in a big canoe, but they all have certain basic elements to them that tell you something happened, but they've tied mythology to a real historic fact because some of their people would have believed it, and they want to have a different God responsible for the miracle that took place. That's exactly what is happening here. Aaron says, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. That's the historical reality. But these be thy gods is the mythology. He ties what he's doing to a historical reality that the people actually experienced. I think that's very similar to what evolutionists do when they tie what we can see and feel in with the natural world into their mytho mythological storytelling of the past. Fifth, Aaron's pleased with himself. He's made the golden calf, but then the text says, and when Aaron saw it, <laughs> he probably, you know, he's, he's molted this thing. He's got all these earrings. He made it. I don't know how many earrings there were, but that's an awful lot of earrings. If it was the men, the women, and the children, all the gold earrings out of their ears. It was probably a pretty big object because we have a minimum of two million people. That's what everybody's willing to admit. I think it was closer to six million people that came out of Egypt. 
You think about if every one of them had only one earring, and I suspect a lot of them wore more than one earring, if they took one small earring, and you have six million earrings that you melt down, you're gonna get yourself a very large golden calf. So he's pleased with himself. When Aaron saw it, he sat back, he scratched his chin and thought, what do I have to do next to make this thing really stick? I suppose, this is only my supposition, but I suspect there were things that were going through his mind like that. Because you see, apostasy is not haphazard. Apostasy is carefully thought out. Apostasy is carefully planned. Every time you see it in church history, the apostate that has plagued the church since its beginning has planned a specific deception, often with the help of demonic forces, as, for example, in the case of Joseph Smith and Mormonism. Number six. Remember this. Apostasy is always connected to some form of true worship. Apostasy, because if everything was totally wrong, nobody would believe it. But if you can connect it somehow to what people know is genuine and valid, you're going to make it stick. Apostasy is always tied to some form of true worship. Quote, and when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord, Jehovah. I think I've told you this many months ago, maybe years ago, in time past. But when Judy was in graduate school, uh, she was a speech and rhetoric major, Ohio State University. And um, one of the classes that she took, the professor, very bold-faced professor, said, when you are giving a speech, it really doesn't matter what's true. What you have to do is manipulate the words in your speech. And you give a different content to words that people accept. And they have one idea, but you fill that word with a content that meets your expectations, not theirs. And so as you speak, you use the word, but you are subtly redefining the word all the way through your speech so that by the end of the speech, when people think of that word, they don't think of the real meaning. They think of what you have put into that word. Dear people, I mean, we could spend the rest of the day going on about uh, how the liberals today have redefined American speech and what is bigotry and what is hate speech and all that kind of stuff. They've redefined the terms. If you redefine the terms, you control the argument. Here's Aaron doing it. He builds the altar and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. He's got an altar and an idol in front of him. It says, a feast to the Lord. And he's just said, here's your gods, O Israel, that brought you out of Egypt. A feast to the Lord. What are you looking at? You're looking at a golden calf. He's redefined the terms. There usually will be two components when apostasy is tied to some form of true worship. I hope you're taking some notes on this. It helps you determine when you're dealing with apostasy. Because there are going to be two components where apostasy is tied to some form of true worship. Number one, the first thing you're going to find, just like you do here in our text, a visible, valid, central focal object of genuine worship. A visible, valid, central, focal object of genuine worship. But it will be connected to the visible, central, focal point of false worship. The two things will be tied together and people can see them. Here, the valid, central, focal object of worship is the altar. The golden calf is the visible, central, focal point of false worship. And Aaron ties the two things together. What's the second thing that we find about apostasy? There are two components when apostasy is tied to some form of true worship. The second component is the pleasurable audience participation. Pleasurable audience participation. He says, we're going to have a feast to the Lord. 
Aaron didn't call for a fast and repentance from sin as on the Day of Atonement, which would later be given in Leviticus chapter 16. He called for a feast. Hey, I think all of us like to go to big, fancy feasts. I mean, if you got invited to some big shebang down at the Hilton Hotel and, you know, some millionaire in the congregation was putting on this feast and invited you all to come and he was going to let you stay overnight in one of the rooms at the Hilton and no cost to you and you're going to have these gigantic banquet and everybody's going to show up for this banquet. It's going to be free as much food as you can eat. The very finest chefs in the world have been hired to come and cook this thing. I think every one of us, I don't just say of you, <laughs> I'd say, man, that sounds good to me. We're going to have a feast. We learn later in the text that the feast, under Aaron's direction and at his direction, was a drunken orgy. Aaron is specifically blamed for having led the people into a drunken orgy and encouraging them to do it. Seventh, something new, which apostasy always offers something new, something new motivates people to be on time. I, I, I hope you see this in the text. The people could hardly wait for the new day to dawn when they would get to worship the golden calf. They rose early in the morning, it says. The people could hardly wait. They would get to worship a golden calf, a God that would never criticize them for their sin. Oh, you've heard me preach on this before. Let's talk about being on time and being late in audience participation. Being late for the portion of worship where there is audience participation is an indication that the latecomers have no pleasure in actual worship. I hope you heard that. If they got pleasure out of actually worshiping God, they would be on time. You see, Aaron's giving them something pleasurable here. If they had pleasure in actually worshiping God, they would be on time. But such folks are only there for the non-participant parts of the service. But Israel, when it came to worshiping the golden calf, was definitely on time. They were like people who bought tickets to a so-called Christian rock concert. They put their money on the line, in this case their earrings, and so they definitely wanted to be on time. The churches where people have not put their money on the line see no reason to be on time. Verse 6, they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's what they did immediately after their offerings. They brought their offerings, got that out of the way. Now, let's have the feast and let's have fun. We'll talk about that in a minute. Eighth. Eighth thing we learn about this apostasy. After making their initial investment, which was the earrings, they were willing to make further investments in their new God. Did you notice they brought two different kinds of offerings? Number one, they brought burnt offerings. And number two, they brought peace offerings. I know for most of us, when we look through all the offerings of the Old Testament, we think, man, they did all kinds of offerings, all kinds of offerings for all kinds of different things, and we just sort of lump it all together in a, in a big lump, and we say, oh, well, all the offerings were symbols of Jesus. Whew, done with that one, let's go on. I don't want to understand what they're all about or what, the, what they portray about Christ. Uh, yeah, they had those offerings, yeah, they killed cows, and they killed sheep, and they killed goats. They couldn't kill pigs, I remember that, but they did kill birds. I mean, there were the, the doves that they brought and uh, for poor people. Uh, so they killed a bunch of animals and there was blood all over the place all the time in the Old Testament and the priests always had blood sprinkled on them and you know, they had these different altars. They had an altar for burnt offering and they had you know, brazen laver and they had, a, uh, there was an altar of incense in there. And there wasn't there a seven branch candlestick so they could see inside the tabernacle? Oh yeah, there was a table of showbread. Man, I sure don't understand that. But Jesus is the bread of life. Oh, and then there was a veil. And I remember a preacher told us that the veil was symbol of Christ's flesh because it was rent in two from top to bottom. And that's what the book of Hebrews says. And then there was the Holy of Holies, the holiest of all, with the Ark of the Covenant and the golden 
cherubim shadowing the ark, and once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which was a fat day, not a feast day. Once a year, the high priest took blood and sprinkled it upon the Hilasterion, the mercy seat, where the Shekinah glory of God rested. And Hebrews tells us that Jesus is our Hilasterion. He is our mercy seat where the blood for our atonement was shed. But for the most part, we just sort of jumble all those offerings in the Old Testament. And we remember there was something about you can't, you know, eat certain kinds of things and, you know, because they're unclean animals and they're clean animals. And, boy, I'm sure glad we don't have to memorize that stuff anymore. There's a specific reason why these two types of offerings were offered by the people in front of the golden calf on the altar that stood at the base of the golden calf. They are distinct offerings and they have specific symbolism in the Old Testament. So what's the difference between these offerings in Scripture? And by the way, neither offering, neither one, related to the sin of the worshiper. I'll talk about that in a second. But neither of these two offerings related to the sin of the worshiper. First, burnt offerings. Burnt offerings were offerings that were to be completely consumed by fire and rise in smoke toward heaven. In fact, the term for burnt offerings makes it clear. Olah, which means to go up or to ascend. The symbolic meaning was that the individual who made the offering was making an entire and complete sacrifice and surrender to God. It was an offering of total commitment. It's never connected to sin. It's always an offering of total commitment. You can look it up. Every place that you look in the Old Testament, it's not connected to sin. Other offerings were offered in relation to sin and they were also burnt. But the ones that are called burnt offerings, the ones that are called burnt offerings relate to completion complete and entire surrender to God. The individual, or in the case of a burnt offering made for the entire congregation by a priest, was thus, this individual or congregation, was setting himself or themselves to a course of life pleasing to the God to whom the offering was made. Complete surrender, Lord. You know, we call for complete surrender to the Lord today too, but not to a golden calf. The God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ himself, who is God manifest in the flesh. We're not merely talking about, okay, he's our God. We're saying making a complete sacrifice, a complete offering of ourselves to God. God, use me however you want to use me. I'll hold nothing back. It all belongs to you. Not 95%. 100% belongs to you. Everything about my life. Everything about my being, everything about my wealth, everything about my, my entire future. There are not very many of us who've done that. And meant it. Say, how do you know you mean it? Because it'll transform your life. It makes a difference. The first offering the people offered was a burnt offering. It was offering a life pleasing to the God to whom the offering was made. Note well, under the law of sacrifices set forth in the Old Testament, and you should someday study it. If you don't know how else to study it, get something like uh, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance and look up every place it talks about sacrifices and offerings and look at all the different kinds there are. Or, or get something like a, a Bible dictionary, Unger's uh, Bible encyclopedia, and look up the offerings and all the different things it tells you about those specific offerings because they are divided into specific categories. Under the law of sacrifices set forth in the Old Testament, the burnt offering was not given in relation to forgiveness of sin. The only sin, only the sin offerings and the trespass offerings dealt with confession and forgiveness of sin. The people are not bowing down before the golden calf, confessing their sins when they offer the burnt offering. They're making a complete sacrifice of themselves, 
to this pagan god. I hope that rattles you to the core when you think about it. The burnt offerings were an act of surrender to worship the God to whom the offering was made. In this case, the Jews were surrendering to worship the golden calf. Okay, so what about the peace offerings? Maybe we can get through this part anyway. Peace offerings were fellowship offerings. Peace offerings were offered by individuals or were offered by the priests on behalf of the congregation to show that they were in fellowship with God, or in this case, with the God to whom they brought it, the God of the golden calf. It's a fellowship offering. There were three kinds of peace offerings. So you can put a subheading under peace offerings. There were three kinds of peace offerings. Number one, the thank offering was a peace offering. That's Leviticus 7.12. Number two, the second kind of peace offering was a vow offering. That's Numbers 6, verse 14. The third kind of peace offering was what's called the free will offering. And a lot of people point to that and say, well, you see, the Bible says we have free will. That misses the whole point of what this offering is all about. And then they argue about there's no predestination and no election because there's a free will offering. Okay, forget that. That's not what the free will offering is about. The free will offering, that's Leviticus 7, uh, 16, by the way. Uh, Leviticus, uh, the free will offering. When the Jews brought the peace offerings to the golden calf, they were doing one of these three things. Number one, thanking the golden calf for bringing them out of Egypt. That's the immediate context. It says, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of Egypt. And so what did they do? They brought bird offerings, complete surrender. They brought peace offerings. Thank you so much for bringing us out of Egypt. Number two, they were making vows of consecration and surrender to the golden calf. Because this peace offering is related to taking a vow. You know, like a Nazarite vow, for example. Number three, it showed their special non-obligatory, it's free will because it's not obligatory. Their non-obligatory appreciation for the golden calf and what the golden calf would allow them to do. In this case, the golden calf was going to allow them to have a drunken sex orgy. It's much like Roman Catholic confession to clear the boards for future sin or the purchase of indulgences to get a free pass to commit future sins without having to go to confession. Very much like Catholic theology on that point. Number eight, we know specifically what the people were anticipating with their new God, which reminded them of the gods of Egypt. They expected that the new God would approve their adventure in eroticism. Here's the phrase, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. How do I know that this phrase, directly connected to the worship of the golden calf, is a reference to indulging in carnal pleasure? Because the text specifically tells us what they did. Verse 22, Moses has come down from the mount, and he's confronted Aaron, and Aaron's trembling in his boots, and Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax off this Exodus 32, beginning in verse 22. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. Oh, come on, Aaron. I left you in charge. What kind of a wimp leader are you? You go along with their wickedness? And the people, it's their fault. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this man, Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. So what if they said that? Who cares? Aaron's using that as an excuse. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me. Then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. Oh, come on. Who's going to believe that? I just took this big, big pile of gold, and I, I, I had a fire over here, and the fire was already burning, so I just sort of dumped it in the fire and wondered what would happen. Do you see how weak excuses for apostasy are? I hope you understand that. When you sin, you think you've got good excuses. Remember Aaron's excuse. Well, I had a lot of pressure on me, Lord. You know, I, I'm under a lot of pressure these days. I mean, it's stress. My, my, my job and my, uh, and my family and, my, and my, 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 about your excuses. 
He really doesn't care because you have disobeyed. You have violated his standards of truth and morality. And when Moses saw that the people, oh, now listen to this. Here's what happened when they rose up to play. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked out of their shame among their enemies, rose up to play. They weren't playing baseball or football or soccer or table tennis. They were playing around. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Here's what the true Lord says. Not the one that you called the Lord when you worshipped the golden calf. Here's what the true Lord says. Put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. Don't spare anybody. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. You see, that's the reference that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 6 and 7, Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters, that's the golden calf, as were some of them, as it is written. Here's the quotation directly out of our text. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Dancing naked in front of a pagan god was standard practice in many of the ancient cultures such as Egypt, Babylon, the Hittite Empire, the Assyrian Empire, and others. We learn from the text that not only did the Levites kill the naked, drunken fornicators who were playing around, but God sent an additional plague to kill more people. Verse 35, and the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf, which Aaron made. Our time's up. What about that plague? What kind of a plague was it? The Lord willing, we'll pick it up there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word. It's a challenge to us. You will not tolerate sexual sin. You will not tolerate idolatry. And when you get fed up, you kill people. Oh Lord, these things were written as examples for us that we should not fall into the same kind of sins that these people fell into. They're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You can't say, well, it's too much for me. It's common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Are you involved in any of this kind of sin? God has made a way of escape. You better take it. If you don't take the way of escape, you face what Israel faced, death in the wilderness. Father, again, we thank you for your word and its power. We pray for your blessings upon it as you apply it to our hearts. Let it not return void, but let it accomplish that which you please, and let it prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is hymn number 624, His Eye is on the Sparrow. Remember that, if God watches sparrows, he watches you and he 